Hello again. And we're back. It is the twelfth installment of our discussions, and we are going to talk about the rise and current state of space culture in this setting. Yep. So, space culture, space culture, space culture, space culture. It all started with the space elevators. Because before that, really, there wasn't a culture up there. There were occasional space stations, nationally based, occasional international cooperative efforts, and that was about it, really. Um, there was no moon base. There were no missions to Mars. Well, there were missions to Mars, but there wasn't a uh, manned mission to Mars before the Yggdrasil elevator went up. The point is, if there was uh, if there was a space culture, well, no, there was no single space culture before then. There were a whole bunch of space microcultures that happened because the same four or five people were trapped up in a little tiny box in orbit for months to years at a time, uh, and there was kind of an informal brotherhood of astronauts. But that's only because the number of astronauts on Earth. Uh, sorry, wrong choice. The number of living astronauts could be measured in the double digits at any given point in history. That changed when space became basically publicly accessible. See, the difference when the space elevator went up was firstly a difference in cost, because once all that money had already been sunk in and all that energy had already been sunk into building the space elevator, it was much more energy efficient with that initial investment already out of the way to get up to orbit and once you're in orbit it takes a very small amount of energy indeed to go higher into orbit or even to go to the moon or off elsewhere because a huge amount of fuel has to be spent in modern day rocket launches to try and get out of the Earth's gravity well and even if you try and do the first stage using the atmosphere to help you a little bit in the space plane model you still spend a lot of energy getting out of the gravity well. And that's what the space elevator does the first step of for you. If you look back at the historic moon landings, the reason they could return to Earth so easily without, uh, without issue, really, was that uh, the moon's gravity well is so much smaller than ours, escape velocity is achievable with a much less energy budget, and they and frankly, were able to carry going, it all with them. And frankly, if you're going in the direction of Earth, then Earth's gravity well is helping you. Yeah. So, that said, uh, space culture still has a thing all its own. There are several different space cultures to look at. Um, to the vast majority of people on Earth, or again, on most of the other places where there is habitation, space culture is romanticized at best. Um, in a world where if you are enfranchised, othering is very small indeed, uh, space culture is really the only cultural other out there. To people on Earth, the only people on Earth who do not view space culture as other are the people who are involved in the space industry. And yep. the space industry is why there is space culture, because once space was easily accessible, there was money to be made from space. First was the shipping. The once there were two space elevators, Universal Transshipping became an existing company, and they specialized in going between the space elevators at first. They later branched out into surface to orbit and uh, surface to suborbital and back mm -hmm. craft, but their initial investment was in small rocket powered craft that went from the top of the Yggdrasil elevator to the second elevator. I don't remember where the second one was built, but it was one of the yeah. several others that were commissioned after Yggdrasil had stood for a few years and proved that it wasn't going to fall down. Which, within a few years of each other, there were several following ones produced. And so a company rose up to fill that niche of let's do the cheap, quick transport from one space elevator to another. Yep. And once there were commercial flights going through space, there was reason to have more commercial stuff going on in space, and there was also the easy possibility of, 
hey, let's use this platform to go do other commercial space stuff, like getting useful things that we can mine out of the moon. There's but all of this is talking about space industry, which is not talking about space culture. Right. The point of space industry as a setting element is that it created space culture. Right. Since it was profitable to go to the moon and the asteroid belt and do these other things, now there are people out there in space controlling the robots, living in space habitats, doing these things. The actual rise of civilian space culture, because that's what we're talking about here, not government-sponsored or program-sponsored, but civilian space culture, followed a very simple set of steps. First, outer space proved to be profitable. The people interacting with space at this point are the people in the space industry for whom it is simply just a part of life. They go up, they come down. If they go up and stay up, they go up and stay up. Uh, for a while, the veteran spacers who went up there and stayed up there were an anomaly because there was nothing up there except for the space stations at the crowns of the elevators. But then, those space stations started becoming a combination of tourist hubs and, uh, well, institutions, for lack of a better phrase, uh, because it takes so re relatively little time to get from the base to the top of the stock, uh, they were able to import fresh food as soon as it would arrive down at the bottom. Uh, it obviated a lot of the issues with getting supplies back to space stations, and people started moving in. Ki uh, the first commercial kiosk in a space station was, in fact, a Starbucks. Um, I'm I, I I'm not joking. It was basically a coffee shop for people who were uh, for for workers who were waiting for their elevator to arrive so they could return back down to the gravity well. Um, and then from then on, uh, soon they expanded to include living quarters, living quarters, amenities, a city uh, city first grew up on top of the stock, and there were basically two types of people who lived there. Three type of person, number one, who lived there is the person who worked there. Uh, they were the ones that actually just occurred to me to mention. The type of person, number two, that lived there are the people who are doing uh, close orbital work. And the type of person, number three, that lived there are the ones responsible for the romanticizing of space culture. And we're talking about the poets, artists, and dreamers who look at a place that is new and different, and in the modern world, some of that is the mythos of New York City, or the mythos of the tropical island, or LA, or Paris, or what have you, and they move there just because it is an inspiring and historic spot. The interesting difference between that and the, uh, the artists who, say, move to Paris to be inspired, is that when the uh, when the first crop of artists got to the Yggdrasil uh, crown, they were not surrounded by inspiring architecture, art, and culture. They were surrounded by metal bulkheads, no windows, and a Starbucks. They installed windows. Actually, they didn't. Oh? They did not, because the thing is... Uh, when you're looking up and out at space, it's boring. Mm. The Star Trek colorized nebulas don't actually exist. When you're looking down to Earth, it's not. But when you're looking up and out, well, okay, so they installed a window, a big window, a couple big windows. But they didn't install windows everywhere. Instead, what they did was they decorated those dull metal bulkheads with abstract and vibrant art giving something new and exciting to look at. This really took root in the Lagrange colony, which is the next step in space culture. The Lagrange colony, the co rather the colony of Lagrange City, was founded at one of the Lagrange points in a completely stable, self-sustaining orbit. Um, and among the first waves were some of those self-same artists who wanted to get in on the ground floor. It was the first joint project between science and art working to a... This was very important because if the artists had been given their way, there would not be a LaGrange city. It would have probably exploded. Which is to say they couldn't do it on their own because right. that's not where their training is. If you try to judge a fish by its ability to ride a bicycle and so on. Precisely. The 
Lagrange City was an investment that Yggdrasil Corporation had a large hand in, and also several national governments, and also several other large corporations, but ultimately it is not owned by any of those powers in its totality. In fact, it only was able to come into existence as a fully functioning and thriving city in space by granting a certain amount of franchise over citizenship and control of the resulting city to the people who built it. So while there is a certain voting share in the city's governance that is controlled by each of the several large factions that put funding into the creation of LaGrange City, the majority of the voting share for the city is actually controlled by citizens of the city. Because of this, because the first major strides into civilian space culture were in fact made by visionaries and artists, uh, nowhere else has managed to completely escape that. Even in utilitarian space, uh, it's undeniable that the psychological effect of art has been, excuse me, has been a godsend on long trips. Um, because of the public perception, space culture, well, human universe wide, can largely be summed up in two contrasting words, bohemian and corporate. Um, breaking that down a little bit, some of this is perception. When you're out in space and you are, in fact, just one bulkhead away from decompression, a lot of people who would not otherwise be responsible suddenly get very responsible. Uh, even the free-spirited artist types who would on Earth be lackadaisical hippie types are probably going to have some degree of practical engineering and are definitely going to contribute to station maintenance and not be wasteful. Even in a completely self-sustaining environment such as the uh, LaGrange City, which actually exports oxygen, it has so much of it, um, you still have that attitude that sprung up from the civic responsibility of the first generation on board. So corporate is probably the wrong choice, but the, the interesting thing is you've got the bohemian aspect, you have the freewheeling, uh, free-spirited, uh, values art, beauty, and um, and and uh, recreation seemingly far more than other aspects. Uh, the bar the barter system is very much in force in space because what does it matter how much energy credit you have back on Earth? What do you have here now that is useful to someone? But on the flip side, there's the corporate aspect. Everything you do in space has to be of some benefit to someone because the resources are far more limited than they are on the ground. So if you are a performing musician, well, let's just say there are no bad musicians in space. If you continue to make your living as a musician, it is not because people are supporting you out of pity. It is because you are getting very good and or very unique at what you do. Some people th take refuge in that uniqueness and uh, get very audacious, which contributes more to the bohemian side of things. Other people simply get more skillful, and a third class of people, with whatever it is they do, uh, try, instead of being audacious, they try to be innovative. So instead of going for shock value, they try to go for something completely new. It is to Nuevo Paradiso's detriment that a lot of the technological, sociological, entertainment and scientific advances have actually come from that mindset in orbit and at LaGrange City instead of at the havens down below. So, speaking of generation, the current timeline where we are setting things to start with, this is right about when the first space-born generation, the first children who grew up entirely on LaGrange City are adults now. Yep. So, they're adults, they're starting to have their own kids, and 
in the time that they've been growing up, the wormholes were discovered, the colonies on the other side of the wormholes started to be founded, and their city has grown from a few intrepid visionary pioneers to teeming metropolis in space. An old-timer in LaGrange City is probably 50 years old tops. So, uh, what does this all mean to your game? Well, one thing's for certain. Uh, if you are a down-below resident, you probably look at the orbital cities as literally heaven. There will eventually be a supplement that we're going to do about doing a game on LaGrange City, but until we do, do put something out specifically about playing in LaGrange City, Compared to the rest of the setting, LaGrange City doesn't have a down below. LaGrange City considers the Earth to be down below. Because yep. LaGrange City is better than you. No, seriously. Their people are better than you. They're responsible for pushing forward ethics. They're responsible for pushing forward science and art and music and even, even archaeology. There are plenty of techniques for preserving small and fragile items that were developed uh, for use in a zero-g setting, but, you know, those can be adapted for down below on Earth. And if it sounds like they could be seen as arrogant pricks by the people who are not from their fancy space city, yeah, there's some of that too. Except that they're not, because they're just so nice about it. And how could you think they meant me? And that's something that will eventually come back to bite them. You can be certain of that. But in the meantime, everyone looks up to LaGrange. Literally. Yep. But that's not, uh, that's not the only extra... Well, that is not extrasolar at the moment, but there are also extrasolar colonies. Um, if you are a resident of a colony, then we are dealing with various stages of Wild West. If you are living on the moon, we're talking about... Mm, if during the Wild West days, you're living basically in Illinois. In Illinois, during the fabled Wild West days, you were about halfway between the civilized East and the Wild West. You had... Uh, you, you could call yourself a frontiersman to the people back in New York City, but everyone further west would think that you were civilized. This is Luna at the moment. Mars? A little further. Uh, just across the Mississippi. If we're talking about the actual, actual extrasolar colonies, yes, we are very definitely talking about the wilds of the American Southwest, or the Canadian Northwest in this case, except with fewer outlaws. To be fair, in the actual history, there weren't all that many outlaws. There were just some very famous ones. And that's exactly what it's like here, except that there aren't even a lot of very famous ones, because you all have to pitch together to survive, because it's going to be six months before the next boat, and if something goes wrong in those six months, you're all in trouble. A hundred years from now, there will probably be very famous outlaws in the history that yeah. tell that is told about those wild colony days, you know, assuming that they don't all die. At but, least one uh, colony is very much uh, like Australia in that many of the people who go there are in fact outlaws. The big difference is uh, with Australia, people were packed up and shipped out there. With this colony, people were given the option of shipping out there instead of serving out a sentence. So it's effectively a sentence of transportation, but it's a chosen one. And people who don't have the skills to hack it on a colony planet uh, are free to simply serve out their sentence instead of being exiled to, oh, I don't know, a hellish death world. Like Australia. Or well, so goes the joke. To a certain extent, there's plenty of poisonous things and uh, creatures that'll eat you. Venomous. Venomous. There's more poisonous things in Illinois than there are in Australia. There's more venomous things in Australia than the rest of the world by volume. I'm not going to argue the point. I sorry. think there's both Digression. kinds of things. But, yes. So, uh, that is the broad strokes versions of the various extrasolar and uh, extraorbital space culture in a nutshell. Um, 
as you can see, all of it is very romanticized, and with good reason. Uh, the further the further away you are from the harsher realities of space travel and space uh, living, the well, the more romantic it all seems. You get out of the gravity well, you leave it all behind, and you go push the boundaries one way or the other. You are liberated. You are free. You are an explorer. You what's that hissing sound? Is there a leak? Yeah, that's a very real chance at any moment in space, because uh, if you are in space, you are an engineer by default, because no one else might hear the sound of decompression. You need to know how to fix a leak, you need to know how to unclog a pipe, you need to know how to hit the emergency release on stuff. There's nobody irresponsible in space. At least nobody irresponsible and alive. There might be some passengers, uh, but they're they're paying extra because mm -hmm. the crew is doing the work for them as well. And they don't tend to go very far. Right. The farthest a pure passenger will go is LaGrange City, and they won't end up staying there because permanent residents of LaGrange City have to learn to be citizens, and that involves that sort of thing. And what this all illustrates for Down Below is that once you actually go out into space and start to live in space, the genre changes. Yep. The core genre of our game, which is this sort of cyberpunk noir uh, mystery drama personal uh, gritty sort of thing uh, the, this personal drama, yeah. this uh, of people who are in a, an, a, an oppressed little bottle, that getting to space is a metaphor or a symbol for breaking out of that in this setting. Now, here's a very interesting question. What about the spacer who finds himself stuck in a down below? Well, they don't tend to last long. Basically, for they someone... They would make an interesting character. They would make an interesting character. But for someone who is, a com who is accustomed to a specific set of expectations and a specific set of shared responsibilities, to be cut loose from those and stuck somewhere that people do not think or feel the same way that you do... At minimum, it's a cl it's culture sh culture shock, and it can get all the way up to stranger in a strange land levels. Uh, people who are part of space culture who end up stuck in a down below for very long tend to burn out very very quickly. They tend to act out, burn out, snap under the pressure, and well, die because they just they can't cut it outside of their environment that they've been adapted to. Um, those that can tend to actually be among the most competent, most uh, flexible, and generally most well-respected members of a Down Below community once they've gotten past that judgment, uh, adjustment period simply because of the things that made them part of space culture to begin with. And, interestingly, this goes back to the romanticization because when everyone who survives happens to be super good, well, obviously everyone in space is super good. And then that goes the other way when a crime boss hires a just fallen spacer for a job and the spacer can't cut it and everything just blows up. This is what we call an interesting story. So if you want to use spacers in your down below stories, whether as PCs or NPCs, keep all of this somewhere in your mind. Keep in mind that they come from a culture that has these different aspects where everybody is expected to have these responsibilities because of practical necessities that mandate them and that it that is different from earth where you can take so much for granted we do not recommend by the way we do not recommend giving spacers more traits what we do recommend is giving spacers more broad traits but the same number of traits Basically, consider that certain things will be less challenging to a spacer because they are everyday mundane tasks for them. So, 
for someone from Earth, certain kinds of engineering tasks fixing the would be very difficult. Uh, fixing the environment regulator system. For someone who is not an HVAC technician on Earth, this is daunting. For someone who's used to working in space, this is my window air conditioner. So, essentially, you have the di the three-way split between most people from Earth who don't have a trait that would let them fix the thing, HVAC technicians who are from Earth and they do have a trait that would let mm -hmm. them fix the thing, and then this being the sort of task that someone from space doesn't even need a trait for, this is not a challenge for them. Yep. Basically, that's the difference. It's mostly a difference of thinking about the different context this character comes from, and there will be times when they can do a thing without it being a challenge, without them having to spend a trait, because it fits the concept of them being someone from space. Pretty much. And on the flip side, if you're using them as an NPC, remember that some of the things that will be challenging for them because they're from space could be places where PCs have to use traits to help them fit in or help them get around this challenge that the NPC has if they are an NPC that's friendly to the PCs. Mm -hmm. And on the flip side, some of the things that people from space are supposed to be hyper-competent at, you could use these as big challenges for PCs if you have an NPC that is a spacer and is their enemy somehow. But above all that, think about it in uh, the, the best way to make sure you put it in context is that basically these people are alien. They're not, you know, incredibly alien, but they think differently, feel differently, expect differently, and act differently from people down the gravity well because they're from a very different environment in as much the same way as a Seattle resident is going to think differently about small things from a suburban Chicago resident. Uh, that is a small way of illustrating how a uh, how someone from the orbital or mm -hmm. or, uh, or or past orbital environments will interact with folks down the gravity well. You look at the difference between Seattle and Chicago, and then you take the order of magnitude difference to London, and then you take the additional order of magnitude difference to Shanghai, and then you take another order of magnitude and you can see the difference between any of those different attitudes of people who all live on Earth and somebody who, while still human, lives not on Earth, no. which is something that does not currently exist in the modern day, but you can take that level of difference to say their experience is this far different from everyone else's. If you want a hilarious interlude, just make sure you have a space station resident trying to hail a taxi for the first time. It's not pretty. Kind of funny. Even if they've uh, been tutored on it, it's, uh, it, it's at least a little awkward. Yep. So, on that awkward note, next time we will talk about something else. It, uh, will it be a surprise? It'll be a surprise. It'll be a surprise. We'll surprise you next time. We don't even know what it is. And if we don't know, how can you know? If you guess what it is, tell us in the comments. And if you're right, then you'll win something. But that we don't too know what that is. Be a surprise. So.